One of the biggest lies Karl Marx ever said was that his vision for a communist society, for a society beyond capitalism, was a vision of freedom, was a vision where humans would be able to achieve their best potential. They would be able to be their best selves. Marx admits that in capitalism we see wonders being achieved, but he says, wait till you'll see communism. It will be more of that. The creativity unleashed by capitalism will be 10 x by the creativity unleashed by communism. As he puts it, we will move from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. And Marx is a very good writer. You buy into his vision and you can't wait to go to the barricades to fight for this future, to fight for this other world where you're going to be your best self. This is how he describes communism in one of his most famous quotes. In communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but it can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman or critic. Now, this is brilliant. You can be an engineer and at the same time an artist and at the same time a content creator, a tennis player, whatever you want. Freedom unleashed. And this was a vision shared by many prominent Marxists, at least at the time when Marxism was pretending to be for progress. Look, for example, this quote by the prominent communist Leo Trotsky. Here is how he envisions a communist society. Quote, the average human type will rise to the heights of an Aristotle, a Goethe or a Marx, and above this ridge, new peaks will rise. This used to be one of my favorite quotes when I was a Marxist, when they asked me, what is communism about? I said, this is it. You will be the most brilliant version of yourself that you can imagine because you will have all this freedom to be who you can be. So if you care about uh, self-development, self-fulfillment, you should be a communist. This was the line. So this is how Marx tells us that he envisions freedom for humanity in the abstract. But there is no humanity in the abstract. There are individuals, me, you, every single person on earth is a unique individual. So the question is, how did Marx view individuals and their freedom to do as they wish with their lives? There is one moment in his work where Marx tells us exactly how he views freedom and it's ugly. Yet he manages to get away with his ugliness because it is hidden in plain sight. It is hidden in one of the most controversial works of Marx in his essay on the Jewish question. When people read this essay, their attention, first and foremost, goes to the anti-Semitic tropes that Marx uses. Listen, for example, to these lines. What is the secular basis of Judaism? Practical need, self-interest. What is the worldly religion of the Jew? Huckstering. What is his worldly god? Money. We recognize in Judaism, therefore, a general anti-social element of the present time. Money is the jealous god of Israel, in face of which no other god may exist. There have been all these discussions on whether Marx is an anti-Semite, focusing on these lines, but people are missing what is the true essence of on the Jewish question. Because the main target of Marx is not the Jew. The main target of Marx is you is every individual who wants to live his life based on his own wants. On the Jewish question is first and foremost not an anti-Semitic manifesto. It is a manifesto against individual freedom. Marx is just using the figure of the Jew, which he considers a universally hated figure, as a symbol of the greedy, self-interested individual. But his target is the self-interested individual, not the Jew. The Jew operates as a symbol to make it even more appalling the man who is after the pursuit 
of his happiness, the man who is after the pursuit of material things. Here is some context that will make us understand this essay better. There was a discussion at the time on whether the Jews should have rights, should have full rights. And Marx intervenes in this discussion and he says, yes, indeed, the Jews should have full rights, should enjoy the same rights as everyone else. But, he says, individual rights are overrated. So this is why I don't think this is first and foremost an anti-Semitic manifesto. It is something similarly insidious though. It is a manifesto against freedom. But don't take my words for it. Let us see what Marx has to say about freedom. Quote, Liberty, therefore, is the right to do everything that harms no one else. By the way, he's right. The limit within which anyone can act without harming someone else are defined by law, just as the boundary between two fields is determined by a boundary post. Again, he's 100% right. But here comes the twist. It is a question of the liberty of man as an isolated monad, withdrawn into himself. End of quote. Notice what Marx did there. First, he presents to you what liberty is, and then he adds this proviso that liberty is only appreciated by people who want to be lone wolves, by people who are antisocial. Therefore, already we should see liberty under suspicion, says Marx. And he continues, the so-called rights of men, the rights of egoistic man, so now he talks about the so-called rights of men. Notice, the so-called rights of men, which he considers to be the rights of egoistic man, of man separated from other men and from the community. So this is how Marx undermines the idea of rights. He says, you being free to do what you want, as long as you don't harm others, you being free to chase your goals, your dreams, your values, your priorities, this is something that is morally suspicious. And this is something which is problematic in two ways. On the one hand, it shows us that you are someone who is an egoist, someone who is antisocial, someone who does not want to live by the decrees and for the collective, the society, the class, however you want to put it. And at the same time, the institution that protects you, the institution of individual rights, is also morally suspicious. Now, already here, I see a huge red flag, pun intended. How can someone be in favor, supposedly, of freedom, someone wanting even more freedom for every individual, but at the same time, he tells us that you wanting to do whatever you want with your life is not good, and the institutions that protect you are also not good. Could it be then that Marx does not really care about freedom? But let us go on. Individual rights are not the only institution that guarantee one's freedom. Another crucial institution is property rights. You cannot be free unless you can own things. You do not have free speech if you cannot own, for example, a camera to record your talks or if you cannot buy a banner and hang it on your balcony. At the same time, you are not free to create and produce if you cannot keep the products of your labor, if someone forcibly takes away the stuff that you have created. So let's see what Marx has to say about the second pillar of freedom, which is property rights. Quote, again from on the Jewish question, the practical application of man's right to liberty is man's right to private property. And he's perfectly right. There can be no freedom without private property. And now he throws the final bomb. Again, quote, the right of man to private property is therefore the right of self-interest. And Marx is perfectly right. Why do we need freedom? Why do we need free speech? the freedom to act, to trade, to cooperate with others, because we want to pursue what is good for our life. We want to pursue our happiness. So what he calls self-interest, egoism, what it actually means is your right to your life, the right to the pursuit of your happiness. And this is problematic for Marx. 
Again, how can you be for freedom, for the freedom supposedly of every individual to flourish, when you are so suspicious on their pursuit of their happiness? And Marxists will say, oh, no, no, we don't talk about uh, the pursuit of happiness in general. We only talk about this particular society when you are only uh, very egoistic. So what will change in the other society? In the other society, we should not anymore be concerned with our own happiness, with the things that are important to us. We should live our lives for others. This doesn't sound like freedom to me. Or they will say, no, we don't mean that uh, there's a problem with uh, personal property. You could have your uh, books or uh, the things that are uh, your possessions. We are only talking about private property in the means of production. Now, this is a huge trap and no one should fall for this trap. Almost every single thing you own could be in some way a means of production. A notebook could be a means of production. You can write something and you can make money out of it. Your laptop, your phone are means of production these days. Your car can be a means of production. Think about it. You work in Uber, you make more money than you, than you put in. The extra money you invest it, it's literally you create capital. So there's no distinction between private property that supposedly you're going to be allowed to that and the property that Marx criticizes as being tied to self-interest. Marx openly tells us that he's against your egoistic pursuit of your self-interest and he's also against you having your own property because he knows that these two things go together. And the question now becomes, if Marx is not happy with the liberty we enjoy in a free society, to the extent that we live in a free society, at least the right that we have to go our own way, to pursue our own goals, to own the things that we have earned. Does he have a better vision for freedom? Because remember, this was the big promise. He said, give away the freedom that you now have, denounce the freedom that capitalism has given you and has created all these miracles that Marx also recognizes it as indeed a very productive system. But he says, give this up because I have something better for you. Does he tell us what is this better version of freedom? Does he actually explain to us what is this vision that he has about freedom? Not in a lyrical descriptions like it will be the realm of freedom and you will be a hunter and a poet. No, no. More specifically, what will this freedom look like? And what Marx has to offer is the following. Quote, Only when the real individual man reabsorbs in himself the abstract citizen and as an individual human being has become a species being in his everyday life, in his particular work and in his particular situation, only when man has recognized and organized his own powers as social powers and consequently no longer separate social power from himself in the shape of political power, only then will human emancipation have been accomplished. What does this world salad mean? Your guess is as good as mine. But this is what Marx offers you in exchange for giving up the freedom that you have. It's something that cannot be defined. It's something that no one knows what exactly it means. And maybe this is the whole point of it. That it is up to the Marxists of this world or the central planners or the philosopher kings to tell you what real freedom is about. You don't need to know it. Trust them. Now, studying Marx more closely, what he probably means with this vision of freedom is a situation where you immerse yourself with the group, where you don't anymore have your private affairs as different from the public affairs, but these two get immersed. Now, this sounds to me like a dystopia. This sounds to me like a complete giving up of freedom, that I cannot go my own way and I'm permanently tied to everyone else in this society. Is this what Marx means? We cannot be sure. Does he mean what we saw in Soviet Union with the forced collectivization, or what we saw in China with a great leap forward, or even what we saw in Cambodia where there was no personal property al allowed? We cannot know. 
So this is what Marx sells us as a higher vision of freedom. And I'm sorry, but I won't buy it. So at the end of the day, there is no Marxist version of freedom. You can have either Marxism or freedom. You cannot have both. Thank you.